On this Father's Day, I would like to preach a special sermon. If you will turn with me in the Word of God to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. I've entitled the sermon this morning, A Father's Heritage. A Father's Heritage. And as I will explain, I got that title right out of verse 3, and I believe that is the heart of what Psalm 127 is all about. And as I begin to preach this text, anyone who has ever gone through premarital counseling with me knows this text, hopefully, after uh, walking through premarital counseling with me, because when I counsel men and women to get married, I take four one-hour sessions in which I walk through the basics of what the Bible has to teach about marriage and the family. And of course, that begins in the Garden of Eden with Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and it deals with what the Lord Jesus himself taught about marriage in places like Matthew chapter 19 and the permanence of marriage and how high of a commitment it is. And toward the end of that premarital counseling, I will always take couples to Psalm 127 because here is a biblical theology of Christian parenting in a nutshell. Not focuses on fathers, but what, what is here is true of the Christian family in general, and there is much for us all to learn in this. But um, if you have a, a, a young son or daughter who one day might get married, this is part of what I will teach them with their fiancé uh, when they sit down with me in my office. And the whole reason is, is we desperately need to recover a biblical theology of the Christian family. The, the reason we have so much confusion and, and, frankly, devastation of the Christian family in our culture is because we do not know or we do not believe what the Bible says here about the Christian family. If we understood what was in Psalm 127 here, it would radically transform our Christian homes. If we grasped what is being taught here, the, the blessings would be exponential to you and your children and your grandchildren and even to future generations. Psalm 127 is a text of Scripture that God used to absolutely crush my pride. I remember it well. It was in the fall of 2008. I went to chapel service at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and Dr. Thomas White preached a sermon from Psalm 127 that shook me to my core. And I had to go home and repent and tell my wife, I'm newly married, no kids at this point, I had to tell my wife that I had been wrong. You see, my theology uh, worldly theology was that I would get married to my wife, but I would definitely put off having children and, and all that comes, the responsibility that comes with having children, at least until I got my doctorate degree. Now, if you know me, you know here I am 16 years later, uh, 2008 to now, 15 years later. Um, so 15 to 16 years later, here I am. I have four children and no doctorate degree. Although the doctorate degree is, is coming along. Okay, I'm almost there. But the point is, uh, something changed in my theology. It was Psalm 127 that God used to absolutely crush my prideful heart and make me realize that the primary task that God has called me to, before being a pastor of a local church, the primary task to which God has called me is to be a godly husband and father. And I had to understand that my pastoral ministry flows out of my ministry as a husband and a father and not the other way around. I'm a husband and a father first. And the only reason I'm qualified to be a pastor is because I am a husband and a father first. That is not to say that all pastors have to be married or have children, but if they are married and if they have children, they must be godly husbands and fathers. It is a part of what 
Paul told Timothy and Titus they must look for in a man who would serve in the office of a pastor. And this is the heart of what it is to be a Christian man. God calls every Christian man whom he gives a wife, he calls him to be a godly husband. And if he gives that man children, he calls him to be a godly father. And we see here in Psalm 127 the very heart of this theology. Now you would not think so. Because as you begin Psalm 127, in the first two verses, these are general statements about life. And then in the second half of Psalm 127, in verses 3 to 5, we get to the Christian home. And and we get to a father raising and discipling his children and the purpose for which he is to disciple them. And when you first look at Psalm 127, you'd almost think that it's too difficult different psalms. Verses 1 and 2, general statements about the Christian life. And verses 3 to 5, specific statements about the Christian home. But actually, it goes perfectly together. Let me read it to you. As I read it, I want you to realize it begins with the phrase, and this is a part of the original text of the psalm. I'm reading out of the ESV translation. It says, a song of a sense of Solomon... Now, that actually gives us some information. So before I read the psalm, a song of ascents of Solomon is a part of the Hebrew text. It is a part of the psalm itself. It's not a part of what they would sing. Psalms are songs, hymns, that the people of God would sing. Okay, This is telling you about, this is like a heading, almost a title to Psalm 127. It is a song of ascents written by Solomon. What is a song of ascent? Well, when the temple was built by Solomon, there were a number of psalms that were written that were called psalms of ascent. And these were the songs that the people of God would sing with their, the, the men of God would sing with their wife and their children as a family as they would go up the mount of Zion to the temple in Jerusalem. So so people would travel from around the nation and around the ancient world, the Jewish people would, and they would arrive at the temple in Jerusalem and it's up on top of a mountain. And as they're walking up the mountain, there would be what was one of the most incredible architectural feats in the ancient world, Solomon's temple. It was truly one of the most beautiful and incredible pieces of architecture that there ever has been. Now this past week, I stayed in Indianapolis, and I didn't realize it, but my hotel was right next to the Capitol building for Indiana, there in the middle of Indianapolis. And I got to tell you, when I saw it, I thought, well, that's a nice courthouse they have there. You see, I'm from Louisiana, where we have the biggest and tallest state capital in America. And I'm not sure that Huey P. Long spent those tax dollars that well to build such a giant state capital building, but it is an impressive structure, is it not? Anyone who goes to Baton Rouge, I mean, listen, you can see it from miles away. One of, the, one of the ways I always knew when I was, because I was raised in the area near Alexandria, and when I would come to Baton Rouge, I knew when I got into about Livonia on Highway 190 um, that I was about 30 minutes out. You know why? Because I could see the state capitol 30, 40 miles away in the distance. That's how massive the Louisiana State Capitol building is. And if you do not know, it is the largest of all 50 state capitals in America. Indiana State Capitol is about the size of our courthouse. It's, um, well, they need to work on that. But anyways, the point is, God bless the people of Indiana and your cute little state capitol building. But the point is, these architectural feats can be seen from miles away. And Solomon's temple was one of those. It was an impressive building. So imagine you're with your wife and your children And you're walking up to the temple in Jerusalem and you're singing this song. Now, of course, they would have sang it in Hebrew, and I'm not going to sing Psalm 127 for you in Hebrew this morning. I could, I'm just not going to. But the point is, as they would walk and sing this song, this is what the father and the mother and their children would sing together as they went to the temple in Jerusalem to worship their God. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. 
It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For He gives to His beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Now, as I said, you read this psalm and the first two verses and the last three verses appear like they don't go together, but they do. You see, in the first two verses, it is dominated by this first phrase, unless the Lord builds the house. Now, now they're walking up to the house of God, the temple in Jerusalem. And so metaphorically, as they're ascending the mountain, going up to the temple, they are to sing with their wife and their children, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So so it's a metaphor, right? You're building a building. Do you want to build it on a foundation of sand or a foundation of stone, right? When you lay the foundation to a building, you take care to build the foundation well and to build it on a firm foundation, one that will stand for years and even generations to come. And what's being done here in Psalm 127 is that the building of the temple edifice, the actual structure itself, is compared to the Christian home. Unless the Lord builds the house... Those who build it labor in vain. What is vain? Well, it is to waste your time on something. To do something in vain is that it all comes to nothing. What does it mean? Unless the Lord builds the house, the house will crumble. It will fall down. It will be built in vain. It will not last. It will not endure. So Psalm 127 verse 1 tells us that unless God builds the house, we labor in vain who build it. Now that's true of any building... But especially is it true of the Christian home. What does that mean? Unless you build your marriage and your family on the foundation of God's Word, you are building your home in vain and it will not endure. Men, hear me. You can either do this God's way or your way. Do it God's way, and your marriage and your home will last. Do it man's way. Do it the way you think is best, rather than what God tells you is best, and you labor in vain. Hear me. God is sovereign. You are not in control of your life. He is in control of your life. If you do not do this God's way, you will regret it. Now, I want to pause and say something here. I am not beating up on people who have experienced divorce or childlessness or have made bad decisions in their past. If that is you and you are here today, there is forgiveness, there is grace in Christ for sin in your past, for things you may have done that you regret. I'm not beating up on those who've been through this. I am primarily speaking to the young people in our church who've not yet married or had children. And I'm speaking to their parents and grandparents to instill this biblical theology into future generations. This is the theology that we must have as Christians if we're ever going to do this God's way. You need to hear what Psalm 127 says to you today. Unless the Lord builds your house... You who build it are laboring in vain. Build your family, build your marriage upon the foundation of God's Word or your family will fall apart. Then he says at the end of verse 1, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Now the watchman would be on the walls of an ancient city in their post, and usually there would be a wall around the city, and there would be posts on top of that wall where there would be soldiers who were called watchmen, and they had to stay awake during a shift at night. They had to stay awake and watch out into the distance and into the darkness to see 
when the enemy would attack. And if they saw the enemy in the distance coming to attack, they were to wake up all the men in the city who would prepare for battle and go out to fight their enemy who might try to sneak attack them in the middle of night. Now he says here, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. What does that mean? Does it mean that they shouldn't have watchmen? No. God commanded them to do that. It's it's like the ancient equivalent of locking your doors at night or maybe having an alarm system. Nothing wrong with doing that. I recommend it. Here's the point though. You're not kept safe at night with your family because you have the best door locks and the best alarm system money can buy. You're kept safe at night by the God in heaven who watches over you. You understand? What's being said here? It is God who secures you and your future and your safety. Not you, ultimately speaking. Now you should work hard and, and you, should, you should protect your family. But you need to understand that you are at the mercy of a sovereign God who rules and reigns from the heavens. And the point is this. You cannot ensure your own safety. Only God can do that. Biblical history is replete and so is world history replete with proof that just because a nation has a powerful military, if they defy the living God of heaven and earth, they will be destroyed. Let me just say something here. The United States of America can be defeated. And if we do not turn back to God, we will be defeated. Because it's happened to every nation in human history that dare, dare defy the living God of heaven and earth. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Mere military might and power alone by itself without the blessing of a sovereign God will not protect the city. Watchmen are good. Serving in the military is good. But the point here is that alone will not protect you. You must seek the face of the living God and obey Him. Because if you incur His wrath, His judgment is sure to follow. You have to submit yourself to God. You cannot protect yourself. You cannot ensure you and your family's future in your own strength. If you don't submit to God and do things His way, you will incur His judgment. So unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So the point is, first and foremost, you need to seek God's good grace and pleasure. You need to make sure that you're pleasing Him or He will destroy that city that does not submit to Him. Now verse 2, men, look at what it says. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Now is Psalm 127 verse 2 saying that you should never wake up early in the morning? No, that's not the point. Is Psalm 127 verse 2 saying there is never a time at which you should go late to rest? No, that's not the point. I think the key is found in that third phrase in verse 2, eating the bread of anxious toil. What are you doing when you're anxious? You're worried. You're worried about what's going to happen next, right? The point here is, this is a man who is trying to secure his own future and his own family's protection in his own strength rather than seeking the face of God. The point of verse 2 is building on the point made in verse 1. You cannot, by your mere hard work and long hours, secure the future of your family. Men, God calls us to work hard. God made men to work. Praise God, amen. Young men, learn to work hard. Embrace hard work. It is a blessing and it is part of how we worship God. You, you know what the Bible says Adam's job was when God put him in the garden before Adam sinned? What did God command Adam to do? To work and to keep the garden. Men, our hard work brings God's glory. Be a young man who works hard. 
Be willing to put in long hours. Save for your family's future or your future family's future. When you get married one day, you're going to need to ask a young lady's father for her hand in marriage. And hopefully when you do that, you will look him in the eye and he will see a young man who's responsible, who knows how to work hard, who knows how to save for the future, and he will have confidence that you're going to take care of his little girl. I mean, sure. People get married all the time who are not prepared to do this. But if you want to do it right, be a godly young man so that your future wife's father will look at you and go, I can trust that young man to take care of my girl. Be that godly young man. Show your responsibility and your work ethic. Show your godliness in how you live and how you treat her. He says here, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. Now hard work and putting in long hours is a good thing. The Bible says in 1 Timothy that if a man does not provide for his own family, that is his wife and his children, he is worse than an unbeliever. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 that if a man will not work, let him not eat. Okay, God has no quarter for lazy men. You understand that? There's no excuse for a man to be lazy. What's being said here though in verse 2 is men work hard, but your hard work is alone is not sufficient to secure your family's future. You must work hard and seek God. A hardworking man who does not know the Lord has not done his duty as a husband and father. Hard work alone ain't going to cut it. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest thinking that by your hard work you can secure your future and everything will be okay. Eating the bread of anxious toil. The reason you're anxious is because you have not put your trust in the Lord. Eating the bread of anxious toil. For He, God gives to His beloved, sleep. One of my favorite preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who preached in London from the years 1850 to 1892, he said once that the sovereignty of God is the pillow that I lay my head upon at night to sleep. What did he mean by that? Because I know that God is sovereign and in control of my life. I can go to bed at night without anxiety or worry because I know God is in control of the future. You see, the heart that trusts in the Lord does not need to worry, does not need to be anxious. And so when it says here that He gives to His beloved sleep, He's saying, you don't have to lay in bed at night worried all the time. Have you ever done that? I've done that. The Bible says if you understand that God is sovereign over your life, you don't have to do that. You could face all sorts of trials and struggles and There could be a million things in your life that you are dealing with and battles that you are fighting. But if your trust is in the Lord, in the midst of all that, you can lay your head upon the pillow of night and know that God is watching over you and your family. He gives to His beloved sleep. Now that's the first half of Psalm 127. Essentially, you need to build your life upon upon the foundation of God's Word, especially when it comes to your marriage and how you raise your children. The Christian family must be built upon the Word of God and what it commands for us to do. So in verses 3-5, to we see the specific application of this. Verses 1 and 2 is a general statement for all of Christian life. You you must do things God's way. You must build your life upon the Word of God and what God tells you to do in Scripture. Now in verses 3 to 5, Solomon specifically applies these truths to the Christian family. And he begins in verse 3 by saying, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Now some translations translate this, children are a blessing from the Lord. And it is true that this Hebrew word is multifaceted and can be rightly translated in a number of ways. I like the translation that children are a blessing from the Lord, and indeed that is part of what this Hebrew word means. But the word translated here, its primary meaning is an inheritance. 
The idea, and you see this throughout the Old Covenant and the laws of ancient Israel, the idea of an inheritance is this. That a father passes down his wealth and his land to his children. And then they pass it down to their children. And they pass it down to their children. And the idea is if you do this right, one generation will labor for things that they will then be able to pass on to their children. And their children will be established better than their parents were. And if that next generation does it right, they'll pass it along to the third generation more than they had. And the next generation and the next generation. Now, of course, if we followed that, there would be little to worry about. What usually happens is there's some generation somewhere that squanders all that the previous generations have worked for. We call that socialism today. Anyways, the point is, understand me, church, the point is you are supposed to be laboring and working for things that you will store up and one day pass down to your children and your grandchildren. That is biblical theology. Okay? The Bible tells us that a righteous man leaves an inheritance, an inheritance to his children and his grandchildren. When it says here that children themselves, not money, not land, but children themselves are an inheritance from the Lord, what that means is, is that you are to see your children as an investment in the kingdom of God. The greatest investment that you'll make in your life is not a mutual fund. It's not your 401k. Invest in those things. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't. I'm just saying that's not the greatest investment of your life. The greatest investment that you will make in your life isn't monetary. It's spiritual. And men, if you are married, you are called to invest in your wife. And if God gives you children, you're called to invest in those children. Children are an investment, a, 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 a Children are a heritage or an inheritance that God gives to you that you are to then pass down to the next generation. You understand the theology? The idea is God has entrusted you with these children. You are a steward of them and you are to pass them on to future generations. Children are a heritage. An inheritance that you will pass down to future generations. Children are are a heritage from the Lord. They are a gift from God. They are not your children, they're His. So you have to raise Him, you have to raise your sons and your daughters the way that God tells you to. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Now, reward here is the word literally for a wage or a paycheck. What's the idea here? It's this. If, if you will invest yourself in your sons and your daughters, it'll pay off. If you will disciple them and raise them up to follow the Lord, it will pay off. Parents of children and young adults, what do we want for our children? I'll tell you what I want. I want my sons and my daughters to grow up to be godly men and women. I want them to follow the Lord. And if God would so bless them with a spouse and children, I want them to have families that will do the same for generations to come. He says here that not only are children a heritage, but the fruit of the womb, which is a child, has a payoff. You invest all this time and all this labor into them. and It's work raising children, is it not? Amen, somebody? It's a lot of hard work. But it's worth it. Okay, let's not just complain about how hard it is to raise children. It's hard. It costs you a lot in many different ways. Amen. But the point is, it's worth it. And there's a payoff at the end. Does anyone regret the time you've invested into your sons and daughters? Do you regret having children? I pray not. They are indeed a blessing. They are indeed a heritage from the Lord. And if you raise them well, it will pay off. That's the point here. You need to see yourself as investing in these little boys and these little girls who will grow up to be men and women of God one day with their own families. And you get, what, 18 years or so to raise them? You better spend those years well. 
You better think carefully about what you do and how you raise them because you only get one shot at it and then they're adults. Verse 4. What, are, what am I to be raising my children to do? Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. They are to be arrows in the hands of a warrior. What's the concept here? We live in an evil world that hates the truth and I am to raise my children to be weapons of warfare to wage war for the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ in this evil culture. I'm raising young men and women of God and I expect them to grow up and storm the gates of hell just like their father has. I expect them to stand for the truth and fight against what is evil. Part of the problem in the United States of America today is that the Christian home and Christian churches have not done this. We've taken a passive approach to the evil in our day. We've sat back and watched as the culture has become more and more depraved and more and more wicked. And very few Christian homes and very few Christian churches are willing to stand for the truth and stand against what is evil. But the Bible says here, listen, this is not my theology, it's God's theology. The Bible says that we should be raising the next generation to be arrows. And I am to be a warrior who has arrows that I'm about to fire out into this world as weapons of the kingdom of God. I am to raise my sons and my daughters to do something for Jesus Christ. To stand for what is right. To be a bulwark against the evil in this world. Like arrows in the hands of the warrior are the children of one's youth. Now listen, it is up to God when you have children and how many you have. But I want you to understand something here, brothers and sisters. The Bible encourages you to get married while you're young and have children while you're young. Not everyone will be able to get married when they're young. It is up to God when He brings you together with a husband or a wife. Not everyone gets to decide if you can have children and how many you can have. But I want you to see here that in Psalm 127 verse 4, God is encouraging you to get married young and have children when you're young, if you can. And we have a culture that says what? Delay marriage as long as possible and have as few children as you can possibly get away with. That's the theology of our culture. The theology of the Bible is get married young and have lots of kids. How many kids? It does not say. And I would not dare put a number on that. But the point is the Bible encourages you to get married and have children and do it if you can while you're young. This is biblical theology and our culture hates it. The culture of death in this nation despises little children and wants to see them dead. That's what the abortion holocaust is all about in this nation. It takes the lives of little precious sons and daughters. The Bible says, no, you see those children as an investment in the future. You raise them up as arrows in the hand of a warrior. Get married while you're young and have lots of little children and raise them up to serve Jesus Christ. Verse 5, blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. The idea is you're going to war and your sons and your daughters one day are going to fight alongside you in this war. Now if you're going to war, how much ammunition do you want to bring with you? My answer, as much as possible, right? You don't want to run out of ammunition in the middle of a battle, right? I mean, this is... This makes common sense. So you need to understand yourself to be making war with the evil in this world. And as you raise these little boys and girls to follow Jesus Christ, you're like a warrior who's putting ammunition in your quiver. Now, they, they had arrows, bows and arrows back then, so a quiver was where the ammunition was stored on the soldier's back and he would have the bow and arrow and he'd go into war and he'd pull an arrow out of the quiver and shoot it in, fire it off, and, and it would make an attack, right? Well, the concept here is you're going into battle, take as much ammunition as you can. And you need to see the raising of your children as preparing them one day to fight in this battle alongside you. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with these children who are raised to follow Jesus. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. What is that about? Well, the gates were the civil authority of the local city-states at this time. The gates were like 
the courthouse or the state capital. In Amos 5.15, God commands the nation of Israel to establish justice in the gates so that the widows and the fatherless will not be oppressed any longer. What is that about? Well, the gates are where government decisions are made. Brothers and sisters, I know there's this theology that some have that, you know, we're to keep our Christian faith within the four walls of the church and we're never to go into society with it, you know, because I guess Christians are supposed to be quiet about the truth. And, and we are never to challenge a, a wicked world government and wicked laws. But the Bible repeatedly commands us to establish justice in the gates, Amos 5.15, or here to go into war and fight alongside the godly children we raise and to not be ashamed when we speak with our enemies in the gate. The idea here is a man of God with his righteous sons and his daughters standing alongside him because he's raised them to serve the Lord as well. And he's fighting against evil in the city gates, in the seat of civil authority and government, and he's fighting for the truth. How about we raise the next generation of warriors like that the way that Scripture commands us to do? The reason we're plagued with such evil in this country and such godless elected officials. Are there some good ones? Yes. But let's be honest, the majority of our political class is ungodly and is leading this nation over a cliff. And the point is, is that we should be raising young men and women who will serve God in all areas of society, including in civil government. And the church in America has long forgotten this biblical theology and this biblical vision for the future. So what's the point this Father's Day? Number one, marriage is good. Get married. Only marry a godly young man or woman. Scripture commands us very clearly Christians are only to marry other Christians. You can come and talk to your pastor more about that. But the point is, marry a godly young man or woman. Get married and have children if God blesses you with them. And raise those children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Understand that you are investing in them and in the future of the kingdom of God. And you are to raise them to be arrows in the hands of a warrior. They are to go out into this world and challenge the kingdom of darkness with the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that is a biblical theology of the Christian family, and that is the Father's heritage that He is commanded by God to pass down to future generations yet unknown. And that's the kind of man, that's the kind of father I want to be, and I pray that for every man in this local church. Let's be the men who God has called us to be, and let's see our greatest investment in this life to be in our wife and in our children. Until Jesus comes again, let's commit ourselves to this good work. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and each one here. Lord, it is such a high calling to be a man of God, to be a husband, to be a father, and yet you have promised to provide all that we need. God, I pray for the men, for the fathers, for the husbands in our church, for the future husbands and fathers in this local church. God, help us to obey Psalm 127 and to live our lives and build our Christian homes and families upon the sure foundation of Your Word. Lord, we pray for our children. Help us to raise them to follow and to serve You. Help us to be godly examples to them. Help us to have this vision for the future. Lord, You gave Your own Son for us. He died in our place on Calvary's cross to pay for our sins. Lord, You gave up Your Son's life so that we and our children might live and know Christ and have eternal life in Him forever. God, may we take up this Gospel and proclaim it to generations yet unborn. God, build this local church through strong Christian homes and families. And may the fathers in this church lead their families well to Your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Yeah.